It can be a frustrating experience to try and light a shot with a domestic light fixture after you've had the experience of working with brighter, more controllable film lights like the LOL kits you normally have access to, but it is eminently possible and I just wanted to make this video to share some tips with you. The sun is the best light you'll ever have. It's bright, directional, and it produces different effects depending on the weather and the time of day. There's a few things to keep in mind when you work with the sun as your primary light source. First of all, one of the most important things you can do in any shot lit by the sun is to choose where the sun is relative to your subject. Try to avoid shooting outdoors around noon when the sun is directly overhead because it makes people's eyes look really shadowy and sunken. This was shot under dense cloud cover and even here you can see that the shadows under my brow ridge are kind of obscuring my eyes. In this example, the sun is behind me. I'm backlit, silhouetted, like the mysterious hero of a spaghetti western. In this example, the sun is directly in front of me, giving me full face illumination. Here the sun is off to my side, still slightly in front of me, producing more of a Rembrandt lighting effect. In fact, any of the lighting positions that we talked about in class can be achieved just by moving yourself and your camera relative to the sun. I can do broad lighting, where the sun is illuminating the near side of my face, and I can do short lighting, where the sun is illuminating the far side of my face. If you're shooting on a clear day and the sun is really harsh, it's often a good idea to find a way to bounce some fill light back on the shadow side of your subject. You can use a bed sheet or a foam panel as bounce, or you can have your subject stand near a white wall and get a similar effect. As you can see, direct sunlight is a very hard, high contrast source. If you're looking for something a little more soft and diffuse, Shade is always an option. Rolling. None of the lights you have access to can ever hope to overpower the sun, even on overcast days, so your use of artificial lights will probably be limited to interiors. I was a cinematographer on a low-budget short film last summer, and this shot is lit almost entirely with household fixtures. The overhead light is provided by a pair of warm-tone LED lights and a string of Christmas lights hanging from the rafters. The lightning outside the window is produced by a pair of LED work lights with a light purple gel over them. I had an assistant stand outside and jiggle the plug. The flashlight is just a consumer-grade LED flashlight. These light sources are different colors, as they would be in real life, and in this case I didn't try to correct them or make them all the same color. This is called mixed lighting. Anything that produces light can be useful to you. Flashlights, computer monitors, TVs, all these can be used to light a shot. The best lights are the ones you can move around. One of my favorite lighting implements these last few weeks has been this gooseneck floor lamp. It's got these three individual LED light sources on it. Um, I can cycle through different configurations and each light is individually aimable. So it's a very, very useful tool. Uh, you're probably all familiar with these clamp lights. If nowhere else, I bet you've seen them in your dad's garage. You can get them for a couple bucks at Home Depot. Um, they're just a, a light fixture with a built-in clamp and a sort of metallic reflector disc to focus the beam. Uh, these are really, really useful because they're lightweight and you can clip them onto all kinds of different surfaces, uh, bookshelves, other furniture, window frames, doors. Table lamps are really useful because they're small and easy to move around. You can put them in shot and they don't look out of place. Uh, lamp shades on lamps can really nicely diffuse or soften your light source and they, they provide a really nice glow that can be an excellent fill light. Christmas lights, particularly plain white lights, are great because they're so flexible. They're not very bright, but they produce a really lovely soft glow, and you can gather them close together or spread them out. Again, they make really great fill lights. The older, not-so-energy-efficient type of lights are usually better for our purposes than the new LED lights because of flicker. Because of the way their electronics work, a lot of LEDs and fluorescent lights flicker unattractively on camera. The older type of light bulb, those uh, incandescent bulbs, are usually better for what we want to do with them because they don't have a transformer and so they don't flicker. But a lot of fluorescents and newer LEDs do just fine on camera. If in doubt, just do a quick test and see if the flicker is noticeable on your screen. I find aluminum foil to be a really handy thing to have around. It's heat proof and you can stick it uh, into a lampshade to direct the course of the light. Or here I'm attaching it to that clamp light with some clothespins uh, to create some sort of rudimentary barn doors. I think you'd actually call this a snoot. 
One of the most frustrating things about working with household lamps is that you don't have barn doors to direct and shape the light source. But by making a little nose cone out of foil and then scrunching it around, I can kind of get the same effect. I'm able to sort of direct the light where I want it to go and cut it off from areas where I don't want it to go. The first step of your lighting process should always be to frame your shot, and then only light for what's in shot. If you're shooting a close-up, for instance, there's no reason to light the entire room. That's way too much work, and it usually doesn't look as good as when you're just lighting for someone's face. As with any lighting process, it's usually a very good idea to start by turning off all the lights in the room. Overhead lights especially tend towards the unflattering and uncontrollable, so it's rarely a good idea to use them in your lighting scheme. Now is a great time to make a plan. What is going to be your primary light source? Try to get that light in position first, then add in other accent and fill lights as you go. You can approach this as any three-point lighting setup with a key light that provides the primary source of illumination, a fill light to reduce the darkness of the shadow side, and uh, then accent and background lights to uh, fill out the scene. Remember your camera's white balance setting? It allows you to pick a point on the orange to blue continuum to register as pure white. Uh, sunlight falls at the high end of the scale, around 6500 to 5000 Kelvin, which means it looks bluer than other light sources. Tungsten lights, like halogen lamps and conventional movie lights, are on the lower end of the scale, around 3200 Kelvin, meaning they're much oranger than sunlight. Um, uh, incandescent lights, like 60 watt bulbs, as well as some warm white LED light bulbs, fall even lower on the scale, around 2600 Kelvin, uh, making them even a little oranger than tungsten movie lights. But if your camera only offers a few white balance presets, you can safely use the indoor or light bulb preset for pretty much any artificial light source you're using. Fluorescent lights and some LEDs also have a kind of green or magenta color cast, which can't be compensated for on the normal white balance scale. Some cameras have a tint adjustment that lets you neutralize that color cast, and most DSLRs have a fluorescent light white balance preset that might be worth using if your lights look a little green or pink. Don't be afraid to mix lights of different colors or color temperatures in your scene. Sometimes a daytime interior lit primarily by sunlight can really benefit from a splash of warm orange light in a dark corner. You can also use more outlandish colors. On film sets, we would use gels to change the color of our lights, but you can shine a lamp through any translucent colored object to get a similar effect. Uh, just take care when attaching material to a lamp, especially incandescent light bulbs, um, even low wattage ones, can heat up with a lot of continuous use and can melt or burn materials that aren't suitably heat proof. This is one thing that TVs and computer screens are great at. Here I've made a magenta fill light by plugging my laptop into my TV and setting my desktop background to the desired color. With enough preparation, you can even produce some wild rainbow effects. Uh, the possibilities are kind of endless when your light source is a big computer screen. If you have access to a projector, you could do the same kind of thing with that, and it would probably be bright enough to use as a key light. 